So what is heart rate variability? Well, it's really just what it says it is. It's how variable or changeable the heart rate is. It matters because research shows HRV is a powerful biomarker for some important traits, including physical health, emotional well-being and cognitive performance. A biomarker is just something that can be measured from the body that correlates with something that we're interested in, like performance or some aspect of health. There's quite a lot of interest in HRV in the research world because it's been shown to correlate quite strongly with quite a lot of different health-related outcomes. So for example, HRV is a biomarker for longevity. If you have a low heart rate variability, then your expected lifespan is lower than if you had high variability. Another example is homeostatic capacity, which is the body's ability to adapt to and rapidly recover from stress, whether physical or mental. It's not just physical health that HRV predicts. HRV has been shown to be a biomarker for stress, emotional resilience, some aspects of cognitive function and executive function, which means something like willpower. It's your ability to make a plan of action and stick to it in spite of distractions and temptations, etc. In short, it's really quite a desirable thing to have high heart rate variability. HRV has two distinct uses. First, as an assessment tool, or a means of making predictions about physical health, emotional well-being and cognitive performance. And then second, it offers a possible training tool, or a means of actually improving these same things, health, well-being and performance. In other words, HRV can be a biofeedback parameter. Now, in HRV biofeedback, we're training something called heart rate coherence. So let's have a look at what that is. Heart rate coherence is one specific pattern of heart rate variation. HRV is a much more general concept. When people talk about HRV as a useful biomarker, they're not really talking about coherence. They're talking about something more general than that. So coherence is a specific pattern of variation and it's where the heart rate synchronizes with your breathing in the sense that it speeds up as you breathe in and slows down again when you breathe out. It's probably easier to take that in if you see a graph. So in this chart, we've got two traces. The blue one is a measure of breath and the other, the red one, shows heart rate measured beat by beat. Each little step in the red trace represents a heartbeat and it's showing the instantaneous heart rate based on the time since the previous beat. So this is breathing in when the blue trace rises up and then it drops back down again on the out breath. And you can see that the red heart rate speeds up as you breathe in and then slows down again on the out breath. So coherence is the aim of HRV biofeedback training. You're learning to access this state of coherence. And why would you want to do that? Well, there's a lot that could be said in answer to that question. But for now, I just want to say that the ability to access coherence is a key component of the mind-body skill set, principally because it supports emotional resilience. It allows you to quickly let go of negative mental and emotional states, and it facilitates access to positive states. Let's expand on that by considering how heart rate coherence relates to the mind-body connection. It must be said that coherence is essentially a non-volitional state, which is to say it's your body that knows how to do it, rather than your conscious thinking mind. It's a natural and reflex-like state that your body can generally access quite easily as long as you let it, and as long as the conditions are right. So you do have some indirect control in the sense that you can set up the right conditions. And the interesting thing is that negative or destructive emotions, such as anxiety, fear, anger, frustration, resentment, they can all block the rhythm. I never forget the time when I first experienced this for myself several years ago now. One night when I was driving back home, I was stopped by the police. It was just a random check and they wanted to see my driver's documentation, my license and insurance, etc. Of course, I didn't have it. So the result was that I had to take them into my local police station and I was none too happy about this, and I went home grumbling to myself. The next morning, when I was practicing with HRV biofeedback, my mind went straight back there, straight back to that conversation with the police, and I found myself doing a sort of inner rant about police harassment, and why couldn't they spend their time going after criminals rather than picking on law-abiding citizens like me? My heart rate trace, instead of showing this nice wave as it usually did, 
was more or less a flat line. I'd lost the rhythm. On the other hand, positive emotions enhance coherence. It can be any positive emotion, but in my personal experience, the most reliable one is what I would call anticipatory enthusiasm, which is when you feel a strong, positive motivation, looking forward to achieving some result or getting something done. Remember I said that heart-brain communication is two-way. On the one hand, the heart responds to emotional signals coming from the brain, for example, connected with frustration and anxiety, with a loss of coherence. On the other hand, when you access coherence, the heart is sending a message to the brain that facilitates access to positive emotions and other useful mental states. Let's return to the question of why it's useful to train heart rate coherence. The short answer is that it's a way of positively influencing physical health, emotional well-being and cognitive performance. But for a more in-depth answer, we need to say more about the physiology that underpins HRV. The main driver is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is a part of the brain's output that controls a lot of the body's automatic regulation processes. In other words, it's non-volitional. It regulates things like heart rate, digestion and energy metabolism. It has two branches called the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And these work like accelerator and brake in terms of bodily arousal. So the sympathetic revs things up, it mobilizes energy and it gets us ready for action. While the parasympathetic does the opposite, it calms us down again and it puts us into a rest and recuperation state. The sympathetic response is a major driver of the fight or flight response, so called because it's preparing the body for action. For example, it increases heart rate and blood pressure and increases blood sugar and diverts resources towards muscles and away from, for example, digestion, which is a much less urgent function. It also triggers the release of adrenaline, which further supports these changes. The parasympathetic response is the relaxation response. It slows heart rate and reactivates digestion. But it's more than just relaxation, because it also activates some of the brain's higher functions, including social functions such as empathy and positive emotions. Now, it turns out that the parasympathetic's ability to slow down the heart depends on breathing. It's as though breathing out opens a gate for the parasympathetic signal to the heart. So during the out-breath, the gate is open and the parasympathetic can slow down heart rate. But when you breathe in again, the gate closes and the heart naturally speeds up again. And this effect is mainly what drives coherence. It's why we see the heart slow down on the out-breath and speed up again on the in-breath. Actually, the sympathetic nervous system may sometimes be involved in speeding up the heart on the in-breath too, but the main driver of coherence is the parasympathetic influence. Then we add to that a secondary effect called the baroreceptor reflex. Again, we don't need to get overly technical here, but if your blood pressure drops low, the baroreceptor reflex raises it up again by increasing heart rate. It does this by influencing both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Now, the natural time scale of this reflex is such that when the breathing is around six breaths per minute, the two mechanisms combine in a kind of resonance effect that maximizes heart rate coherence. Actually, there are other lesser influences besides. The heart's rhythms are indeed a complex phenomenon. But don't worry if this is all sounding rather technical, because really the only thing that matters in practical terms is that heart rate coherence is naturally strongest at a breathing rate of about six breaths per minute. That's one breath every 10 seconds, which is pretty slow for most people. A typical normal sort of healthy breathing rate for an adult is about 12 to 14 breaths per minute. Another factor to mention is that abdominal or diaphragmatic breathing, as opposed to chest breathing, seems to enhance coherence. We've talked about the incoming influences to the heart, but remember heart-brain communication is two-way. So let's talk about how the heart influences the brain. There are a number of channels of communication, one of which is the vagus nerve. Actually, about 80% of the traffic within the vagus is going from heart to brain, with only 20% going the other way. So the brain is sending signals to the heart, but it's also very definitely listening to the heart. 
and in turn the brain is modulating its own signals so we have a kind of feedback loop in which the brain and heart respond to each other. During periods of heart rate coherence the brain's electrical rhythms or EEG in some sense fall into step with the heart's beating. This sort of synchronizing effect seems to help the brain to operate more efficiently and may explain why, for example, reaction times are found to be faster in heart rate coherence. We also know that during heart rate coherence there's greater activation of the prefrontal cortex, which functions as the brain's executive control area. It's heavily involved in what's called executive function, which I mentioned earlier. Executive function includes the ability to focus and concentrate, but also motivation and decision making, so your ability to make plans and to keep to them. The prefrontal cortex also plays a major role in emotional regulation. It has the ability to inhibit brain regions such as the amygdala, which generate emotional responses in the body. The whole mechanism of heart rate variability and heart rate coherence is to a good extent independent of breathing chemistry, which we discussed in the last module. Not completely independent, because, for example, abdominal breathing is important to both. But this is important from a practical point of view, because it means that you can get good heart rate coherence and still be over-breathing. Indeed, you may even get better coherence by over-breathing. I've noticed a tendency for people who try out HRV biofeedback without first learning about breathing chemistry to induce overbreathing. Why train heart rate coherence? Why is HRV biofeedback worthwhile? Well, first, you're exercising the parasympathetic nervous system. Heart rate coherence is a state of parasympathetic dominance, which means that the body is going to relax and switch into a kind of repair and rejuvenation mode. In fact, you probably want to be spending a lot of your time, most of your time even, in parasympathetic dominance. That's not to say that sympathetic activation is a bad thing, or that the fight or flight response is bad or harmful, but what is harmful is getting stuck in a low level stress response all day. So to repeat a point I've been making throughout the course, adaptability is the name of the game. It's shifting your state to best meet the circumstances you face. So you want to be responsive to stress and challenge, but you want to be able to relax back into parasympathetic dominance as soon as the stress is over. An important point here is that recovering from a stress response is about activating the parasympathetic more than calming down the sympathetic. Indeed, it's thought that the main mediator of everyday stress, at least relatively minor stress, is withdrawal of the parasympathetic influence rather than the activation of the sympathetic. Coherence training has physical health benefits. Research studies have been published suggesting it can help with a number of health conditions, especially those mediated by the autonomic nervous system. Perhaps most notably, what are called functional gastrointestinal conditions, such as IBS and abdominal pain. It's known that the gut needs quite a bit of input from the parasympathetic nervous system via the vagus nerve in order to work properly. Also on the list is cardiovascular disease and hypertension or high blood pressure. Practicing coherence supports executive function and cognitive performance. As I said earlier, it activates a key brain region, the prefrontal cortex. Executive function means your ability to pay attention, to concentrate and stay on track in the face of distractions and temptations. Studies show that it can help with cravings and impulse control. So, for example, it can play a role in stopping smoking. Again, in connection with prefrontal cortex activation, coherence training can support emotional regulation or emotional resilience. In fact, both its aspects, that is, letting go of negative emotions and accessing positive emotions. I don't mean to say that coherence is going to somehow automatically generate positive emotions for you. I think that's too simplistic. Rather, it just creates favorable conditions for positive emotion. So if you're in coherence, and you can do something to trigger positive emotion, then it's like you're planting seeds in much more fertile ground. Actually, we've got a kind of positive feedback loop where positive emotion and coherence feed off each other. Again, the heart-brain communication is two-way. When positive emotions arise from a state of coherence, it'll tend to enhance the coherence, and this in turn will strengthen the positive feeling. And on the other side, coherence is really incompatible with the sort of negative physiology that underpins anxiety, frustration and anger. 
So if you can shift into coherence or remain in coherence in the face of stress and negative states, then it can take the heat out of the negative emotions. That's not to say that it's easy, but with training, you can get better at it. In terms of disorders, research suggests that HRV training helps both depression and anxiety. I think coherence training can work synergistically with mindfulness, and we're going to be looking at this in a later video in this module. So to sum up, heart rate coherence supports access to clear, calm focus tinged with positivity. And that's got to be one of the most widely useful mental states there is. One last point. The benefits of coherence don't just apply as long as you're in the state of coherence, they are longer lasting. Again, it works on an exercise and fitness paradigm. If you spend half an hour at the gym every day, you're going to feel good throughout the day as a result. It's like that with coherence training.